Hi everyone, we're so excited to be here at the first ever Cilium Con and talk to you about how we use Cilium at Bloomberg to build our data sandbox. I'm Ann Zapecki, I'm an engineering team lead out in our SF office, and I'm joined today by my colleague. I'm Sri Tej, uh, can you hear me on the mic? Awesome, okay, cool. <laughs> um, well, I think I just wanna start by being like extremely transparent about what our motivation is for this talk. Uh, you know, this week at KubeCon, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, really interesting and wonderful talks about uh, you know, critical production issues, things that went wrong, facing bottlenecks at scale, and, you know, we have our fair share of uh, technical challenges that we're going to be talking about today, but we also wanted this talk to be a bit different. Uh, we know that a lot of you that are in the audience here, or, you know, maybe on the stream, don't even use Cilium in production yet. I mean, you may be just like walking in like off of the uh, convention floor, like from KubeCon itself. Uh, and if that's one of you, uh, the number one question that's gonna be on your mind is just, is Cilium right for me? So what Anne and I are gonna do today is showcase a practical application of Cilium uh, just straight out of the box or integrated with other technologies, and then explain how we're using it at Bloomberg to create valuable business products. Um, and then with that, uh, the high-level overview of the talk today is gonna be first, what we built, and importantly, how did we decide to build that? The second thing is how we built it, and then finally, we're gonna be talking about some of the things that we learned during the process, and then maybe it'll be, it's gonna be helpful for you as well. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Anne, who's going to talk about what we built. Awesome. So we're from BQuant, uh, which is a group at Bloomberg that builds a quant analytics platform that runs in the public cloud. We use CNCF technologies like Kubernetes, Helm, Terraform, and of course Cilium, which is why we're here today. Um, and our platform enables quant analysts to be able to build financial research and production workflows using Bloomberg data. Um, and there's a little asterisk there. And, you know, we want to be able to have our clients be able to do this, build their workflows in a secure way. Um, so Street Tech is going to talk a little bit about how we make this possible. So we need to, you know, create something called like a data sandbox. Uh, and all that means is a way to launch Jupyter workloads that have a broader access to data, but a more limited scope on how they can use that, which includes things like data flow and data distribution. Uh, so the question is, how do we enforce that users can't easily export protected data from these BQuant workloads? Uh, and there's going to be like a few factors here. Uh, there's a contractual element, there's a commercial element, uh, but what we're, what we're interested in is the technical component uh, in which we fortify our network using Cilium. So I want to pause right now because that was a lot of words and, you know, I like to kind of have a simple slide to break up all the text, uh, but I wanted to remind y'all of the point of the talk today, uh, which is just, is Cilium right for me? Uh, I actually want to go a bit farther. Uh, I want all of y'all to say it, like hear the words kind of out of your mouth. So uh, on three, uh, I want you to say, is Cilium right for me? So one, two, three. Is, is Cilium, Cilium right, right for, for me? me? Awesome. <laughs> so I mean, I think the important thing to note though is the answer could be no. Um, it's true that there's that saying that uh, no one ever gets fired for buying IBM and uh, in, you know, engineering hours are really expensive uh, and to use a new technology is always risky. But with that risk comes like new opportunity. Uh, and it's that opportunity which you can use to justify uh, using a new technology and then you know, putting in the effort and the cost. Uh, at Bloomberg, we decided that it was, was worth it uh, to you know, use Cilium. Uh, we did a comprehensive review of what our customers' use cases look like, as well as looked at the type of risks that we uh, could face. And then we used that to construct a threat model. And 
with this threat model, uh, we were able to you know, factor in things like our contractual elements. Uh, we were able to limit the scope in some areas. Uh, so we were able to focus on automated data egress as well as customer resource access. Uh, so what we were looking for is a very lightweight solution uh, for a limited in scope problem. And that is what we use to justify Cilium for our use case. Uh, now, you know, it's entirely possible that your company's customers are not going to be our customers, but at the same time, their needs uh, may be very similar. And with that, you can justify using Cilium as well uh, because it's a very powerful technology. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anne, who's going to talk about exactly how we built this data sandbox. Awesome. Thank you. So we use Cilium as our container networking interface, as some of the other folks um, that, who have spoken already today do as well. Um, and it's really beneficial, you know, BQuant runs in the public cloud, and so we're able to replace the cloud provider CNI with Cilium. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we chose Cilium, is because it is a full CNI replacement. Um, but a little bit of story time. So, you know, we want to uh, kind of control the uh, access out of BQuant workloads um, because it's running the public cloud. We don't want access to the full internet from those workloads um, because that provides some level of risk for our clients. Um, so we wanted uh, host-based policies um, to be able to control what our clients are able to access from these BQuant workloads. Um, we are able to use Cilium to do this. Um, and then when it came time to build our data sandbox, this provided another kind of layer on top of that to be able to um, build the, a true data sandbox around this. Um, we restrict cluster network access to specific ports and host names required for Jupyter as well. So another one of the reasons why we are able to uh, use Cilium uh, to build the data sandbox. So we use L7 network policies, um, specifically are forbidding anything that's exporting data from this environment. Um, and so this is preventing uh, data exfiltration to trusted entities, right? Um, all this is RESTful. It's probably the first of many pieces of YAML that you'll see throughout the, the course of the week. Um, but we filter the workloads that are running with the sandbox mode, so it's a label on our resources, and then are able to enforce these policies on traffic coming out of these workloads. We chose L7 for a few reasons. One, it allows us to make decisions based on transportation or information at the application layer rather than at the network or the transport layer. Um, the performance cost of doing this ends up being negligible because of EBF, eBPF and its magic. Um, the violation of L7 rules doesn't result in a packet drop, which means that we're able to pick up when there's an error and that traffic is not able to, um, to leave the node. So. Um, it's not the case for L3 and L4 policies. And then finally, with L7 policies and pod annotations, that traffic is proxied through an Envoy instance, which means that L7 traffic targeted by the policies depends on the availability of the Cilium agent itself. Simple, right? Easy. One piece of YAML, Cilium network policy, that's it. We built this valuable business feature. It's not quite that easy. Um, TLS termination and origination make it a little bit more complicated. Um, so our BQuant workloads need to trust the traffic that comes back from Cilium, which means that essentially what we have to do is we have to provide private certs and keys um, that we generate on the cluster. We store them as secrets. Um, and we take the certificates generated by um, the root CA and append our uh, certificates on that. Um, and then the Cilium agent is actually pulling these secrets on the cluster, so these private certs and keys, um, to be able to do the TLS termination and origination. And we want to be able to automate the generation of rota and rotation of the certs that we're generating on the cluster, so we use Helm to do this. There was some lift to set this up, um, but in the end, it allowed us to have a, a fully um, comprehensive solution um, that was secure. Pass it over to Shrishas to talk about the flow of outgoing traffic from our BQuant workloads. Yeah, so I'm a visual learner. Uh, I know Anne is one too. Uh, so let's just like run through an example of a user running a BQuant workload. 
Uh, this is going to be our architecture right here. Uh, you can see the user space and the kernel space. Uh, and then you can see that Cilium is going to be deployed as a daemon set with the Cilium agent as well as a Cilium Envoy proxy. Uh, you know, let's make this horizontal <laughs> to make it even simpler. Uh, a user in their workflow is going to be accessing protected data in the sandbox. Um, now the user is going to either maliciously or not try to export that protected data to the S3 bucket slash prod slash forbidden. Now the outbound request is going to go to the Linux kernel. And at this point, the Cilium agent would have compiled eBPF programs uh, to say that, you know, if the traffic is going to go outward, send the traffic to this port, which is serving a Cilium Envoy proxy. Now, the Cilium agent is going to read the network policy and configure the Cilium Envoy proxy using the XDS API. And then the Cilium Envoy proxy is going to be the one that's going to make the decision, uh, do the TLS inspection uh, to accept the traffic or reject it. But in this case, it's not going to allow the outgoing traffic to the S3 bucket slash prod slash forbidden. Uh, and the user is going to fail to export the data from the Beak One sandbox. Now, this by itself is already super useful for us. But now Anne's going to talk about how we decided to take it a bit further. Yeah, so we built on the capabilities that we provided with this data sandbox um, to build intermediary data storage. So we found that some of our clients had workflows that required flexible storage to do a variety of things, from storing intermediate models to handling cache results between runs of jobs to handle, handling processing for really large files or stashing generated signals. Um, so what we built on top of this functionality was what we call sandbox storage, um, which is dedicated as three buckets that can be accessed from within the BQuant sandbox. And that access comes from uh, exceptions in our Cilium policy and through integration with Cloud Identity Federation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's actually set up. So a little bit of context here. Each of our BQuant workloads has a corresponding OIDC token that helps secure access to data. This is issued by our Bloomberg identity provider. Um, and we use STS in AWS, or this Cloud Identity Federation, to enforce access control via IAM. So specifically, we're using the Assume role with Web Identity, um, which allows us to use IODC compliant tokens to fetch temporary limited privilege access tokens um, that users can use to then access their S3 or other AWS resources. So again, we're, we're uh, controlling access uh, to resources via IAM. Um, we're able to leverage session tags to know which IAM policy to enforce. And as I had mentioned before, we have a means of uh, labeling our workloads to know which ones are running in our data sandbox. Um, and we're able to use that information um, actually in our token as well, um, specifically in the session tags, to be able to know which IAM policy to enforce when we are um, accessing data from, or accessing data storage from the BQuant sandbox. So the user can access this intermediary storage corresponding to the sandbox as enforced by both the IAM and Cilium policies. So if we put that all together and take a look at what this looks like overall, um, you can see that initial call to use our OIDC token uh, with assume role with web identity to be able to fetch those AWS limited uh, privilege credentials uh, for the IAM user um, with that policy, um, and then when a user sends a request to write to that data storage, that traffic is inspected by Cilium. We have, uh, you may have seen, if you were really closely inspecting that YAML from a few, sli few slides back, um, that we have an exception to allow access to these particular resources in our Cilium policy. And so once it passes the check from Cilium, then we go onto the um, AWS side um, and are granted access to those resources via the um, IAM policy that the user has. And you can write to your storage. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes, uh, but what the user ends up seeing is actually quite simple. If the user is going to try to export protected data to one of their sandbox buckets, it'll work. But if the user tries to export that same protected data to any other S3 bucket, they're going to hit a 403 forbidden. Um, 
from their perspective, it's that simple. So, I mean, we just talked a little bit about how we built it, but now I think it's time to go on to uh, some of the things that we were reminded of in the process of building this, uh, which were really useful for us to remember, and then hopefully you know, sharing these will be useful for y'all as well to figure out if Cilium is right for you. Uh, well, I think the first thing to remember is that you can start small. Uh, you don't have to build the perfect product all at once. Uh, and it's actually quite valuable to uh, analyze your customers' workflows and then see what works for them and then offer more functionality incrementally. Uh, that way you can offer more value to them and then they'll probably pay more for it. Uh, now, the first way that we did this is through data replication across multiple regions. Uh, this is for the sake of disaster recovery. Another way is an approachable user experience. Now, we use uh, Jupyter workloads primarily, and then Jupyter is well known within the industry uh, for being very easy to use, and then we want to make sure that our user experience is up to that same uh, bar. And that goes for anything uh, starting from the point that the user is going to log on to the platform to the point where they launch a workload, uh, and even within the workload, uh, the ability to access you know, very handy environment variables so that they don't have to think about, well, which bucket do I have access to? Another thing that you know, we should mention is that at Bloomberg, security is going to be our number one priority. What this means is all the way from clusters are going to be segregated by customer. Uh, we're going to default to a default deny policy uh, whenever we can. Uh, and then Anne went into a lot of details earlier about how we manage uh, cert uh, rotation uh, to avoid some of the intricacies there. And then we think that this is all worth it for the customer, and then they end up seeing the value of this. So I think another thing that we should talk about is comparisons with alternatives. And uh, the first thing to say is shout out to Anistio Day uh, that's happening later as well. Uh, I know that we have a sister team that's uh, presenting a talk there. Uh, and when we were evaluating options, uh, we decided to go with Cilium not only because of its host-based routing policies, uh, but just because of how performant it was with eBPF. Like having it in the kernel itself is a game changer, and I'm super excited to see a lot more projects starting to implement this, like with Calico, uh, Falco, and then there's, it seems like there's more week by week. Another thing to mention is the access to a lot of professional support. Uh, I think Cilium is really lucky to have a really robust market out there of experts who you could potentially you know, pay to do things like uh, troubleshooting uh, and then to help debug, uh, which you know, we've really benefited from. And then you know, I think it's also important to mention, uh, I know that Thomas earlier had the picture of like not being able to see anything in a snowstorm, but observability is really important to us. Uh, and then we definitely have gotten a lot of use out of having Hubble on our clusters, and I'd love to hand it over to Anne, who can talk more about that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so definitely love Hubble. Uh, provides a lot of observability, um, which is very helpful, not only to be able to have that application and network visibility as we're uh, looking into uh, what's happening on our clients' clusters, um, but we've also found that this is a really beneficial learning tool for people on our team that are new to Cilium or new to the team. To be able to see the network flows and see what's happening with the traffic as it's coming in and out of our workloads has been a really powerful way to be able to visualize how all of this works together. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. So a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, with the Hubble UI, but we have our service map up here, um, and you can see information, source and destination identity, um, the ports, right, the, um, what happened to particular packets. Um, so very helpful to be able to do that. And then you can actually trace right, that in more detail and see those network flows um, to be able to understand. You can see Shrit has showed uh, two examples of uh, successful and failed requests to export data um, from the sandbox. And you can actually see those um, here on the screen as well. So um, 
definitely has been a very helpful tool uh, for learning as well as um, you know, being able to uh, debug any client issues that may come up. Yeah, I, I really like Hubble. I was just using it last week. Um, but I wish that something that it had more of is the ability uh, to filter better. And I was just like, you know, manually typing in uh, all of the labels that I wanted. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's something that we have the opportunity to change. So I think that I wanted to make one of these last slides just a reminder uh, to everyone to just be good open source citizens. Uh, at Bloomberg, we rely on a really healthy open source ecosystem. Uh, and then there's a lot of ways to support open source, uh, all of which we believe in. I mean, there's things like sharing use cases, talking about pain points. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of what these talks are going to be about this week. Uh, but, you know, also a bit more actively uh, in a direct form, you can contribute to developer docs or you can open up issues, NPRs. I know that, you know, our teammates definitely have, uh, I think, some open issues right now. Um, which I'd love to discuss, but we probably shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but you know, in a different format, uh, you can also help out monetarily uh, by opening up a FOSS contributor fund. And at you know, our company, we found a great amount of success for having this fund for free and open source software. Uh, that just is a easy way to democratize, uh, just giving funds to projects that are used by everyone uh, on a quarterly basis, which makes it really interactive. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Anne, uh, who will close us out. So we're going to end this with a little bit of a call, of ac call to action for all of you here. Um, the first one is think about where Cilium could fit into your needs. Figure out if it is a good solution for you. If you're here, there's a good chance it is. Um, but think about you know, how you can use that to build the functionality that you need. Um, and another point that, um, that we've made throughout this talk right, is don't be afraid to start small. You know, we introduced Cilium um, as our CNI initially, and then we're able to build a lot of really valuable functionality on top of it for our data sandbox and um, for our sandbox storage functionality. Um, so don't be afraid to start small. And, add later and keep, keep building, uh, which I think is a kind of a good attitude that already exists within the open source community as well. And then finally, contribute back to the open source community. Find what works for you. I know I'm working on my, my first draft PR uh, for Cilium itself, so that's been exciting for me. Um, but definitely, um, you know, I'm really excited um, to engage with, with all of you and, and be a part of this community. Um, so thank you all um, for your time and attention today. Um. And, and we have time for a, for a few questions. Uh, first of all, thank you that you have an amazing way of presenting, first of all. Um, I was wondering, if you use something like uh, Cilium, first of all, it's always about security, as you've stated. Um, but as you um, streamline the, uh, the, yeah, how the data flows and where the packets go, does it also have uh, positive impacts on the performance? Right. I think that definitely influenced uh, our decision to use Cilium as opposed to an alternative at the point where we made the decision. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, you know, really struck by how non-intrusive uh, the Cilium model was in terms of being able to do what we needed uh, to do host-based routing, uh, you know, as opposed to like setting up sidecars and things like that. Another question, maybe? So in one of your earlier slides, you showed the flow. I think, uh, I'm sorry, I, think, I don't think the mic is working. <laughs> Testing, one, two. Yes, better, it's thank better. you. <laughs> in one of your earlier slides, you showed that the flow goes from Jupyter to an eBPF program, and then that gets forward. Yeah, we can go back to the slide. Yeah. Uh, Before this, it was okay. the, oh, the yeah. linear one. This, this one. one, this eBPF step. 
did you guys develop your own eBPF program, or w did that come out of the box with Cilium? Yeah, we did not need to develop our own eBPF program. Uh, we just used the uh, Cilium network policy, uh, specifically an L7 policy that only allowed uh, gets, heads, and uh, I think options. Mm -hmm. uh, and then therefore, you know, put a default deny on everything else. Uh, and then, you know, it's also important to note that uh, this was for like trusted entities with like say S3, uh, you know, there's potential for, uh, for untrusted entities to like, you know, do some, some trickery with these like HP methods. So, uh, for our purposes, like that was sufficient. And I think also, um, one of the benefits of integrating with Cilium is that because we were able to use a lot of this uh, functionality out of the box, it was a pretty easy transition, aside from the part that we mentioned with uh, some of the, the TLS termination origination and then the uh, certificate manager that we needed to build there. Um, but overall, um, more of a seamless integration. Uh, what prevents uh, the user from exfiltrating the data through the web page of Notepad? Like observing yeah so if i i think i heard the question correctly you said what events are the user like what what prevents so a user gets data yeah. access by running a job and uh, yeah, the job sends data back to user's browser so what what prevents that way for data leak from i didn't hear the last so I, I think so, it's what prevents a user from running a job to start exporting the data right uh, um, yes. yeah so okay yeah i can answer that one um yeah so kind of as we mentioned before there are three parts to our data sandbox uh the last of which and the part that's probably most relevant here is the technical piece right so no you can't start writing to random s3 buckets you can only write to the ones that are provided as part of the the sandbox storage offering that we have um, um, but those other two pieces are the um, the commercial piece and the contractual piece, right? So with our clients, we do have an agreement um, that, you know, you're not supposed to be exporting that. <laughs> That's less exciting, so we won't we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, what's also helpful is we offer other solutions yeah. uh, if they do want to do that. Uh, so it's just really knowing what your customer. Uh, wants to do with the product and then trying to address it wherever you can.